Hey, it's Ben, and welcome to Lecture 8 of Open Project Space. This time we're talking about PCB design concepts. This will be the foundation for a follow-up workshop where you learn PCB design software, particularly with KiCad. But for now, let's focus on those basic concepts that are going to help you understand PCB design later on. Of course, I would start with an introduction to PCBs. What are PCBs? Well, a printed circuit board, or a PCB, is an electronic assembly that uses copper conductors to connect components. So relative to something you'd use to prototype, like a breadboard, this is more of a permanent structural support to electronic components. So in this photo reference on the right, you'd see the PCB that's in green and components are soldered too. That is a much more permanent way to arrange components compared to say a breadboard. And this is made from alternating layers of conductive, and this is usually copper, so conductive and insulating materials. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later. So how are components connected to the board? Well, we have pads. They're exposed copper surfaces, which we connect the leads of the electronic components to. And of course, when we connect the leads, we do so by soldering the leads to the pads. Now, some pads are designed for surface mounted or SMD leads. If you remember from several, several lectures back on integrated circuits, we talked about different packaging for components. They're surface mounted and through hole. The distinctive factor being through hole leads go through the PCB. This is a drilled hole with an exposed copper surface pad that you would solder a through hole lead to, whereas the surface mounted pads are just on the surface of the PCB. A component's lead would be soldered to this. It wouldn't go through the board, however. So we have SMD pads and through hole or THT pads. So how does current get from one pad to the next? Well, traces or copper tracks connect these pads. So you can see here that underneath this green layer, which we're going to call the solder mask, we actually have these lines which connect the different paths. These lines are those traces I'm referring to here. We also have vias. How do we get from one layer of the PCB to the next? Because remember earlier I said a PCB is made of multiple conductive and insulating layers. So if we have multiple conductive or copper layers, how do we get from one copper layer to the next? Because we can put traces on each of these copper layers. Well, we do so through vias. Vias are conductive holes drilled into the board, which can connect those different copper layers. Now, we have different types of vias, and we could observe them through this cross-sectional view of a PCB. Now, bear with me, it's a little bit more abstract. So we have those alternating copper and insulation layers, right? Each copper layer might have different traces. How do we connect those different layers? Again, through vias. We have the through hole via. This would be a type of via which is drilled from the top layer of a PCB to the bottom conductive layer of the PCB. So top conductive layer, top copper layer, to the bottom copper layer. We have blind vias. These are drilled between two internal layers. So if we had this internal copper layer, and this other internal copper layer, we could connect the two by using a blind via. And lastly, of the three common via types we're going to explore, we have the buried via. This is drilled and plated just like the rest from the outside layer, either top or bottom, from the outside copper layer to an internal layer. It's a buried via. And of course, somebody might ask, if a via travels through multiple copper layers, how does it prevent itself from connecting to those copper layers which it passes through but does not connect to? That's pretty simple. We just have a void that we leave around the via where there is no conductive uh, material and that prevents the via from connecting to any nearby traces as it passes through a copper layer, which is not meant to connect. So for example, in this through hole via, which I've been pointing to, it connects from the top 
through two layers to the bottom copper layer, but it does not connect to these two internal layers. As you can see, a void a white gap has been left in between the via and the copper traces. We have planes. So these are interconductive layers that are often used to create a ground point that is shared by traces and vias. And these are used as the return path for current leaving components. So if we had uh, pads which serve as the return path, uh, like ground pin, this pad is going to likely be connected to a via, possibly like this one over here. And this via is going to go straight to a plane within the PCB that is strictly uh, this ground plane. And the plane is that large area of copper, like the entire layer just serves as one single ground point. We also have fills. Fills are large areas of copper used for the same purpose as planes, but instead of being its own layer, it can be integrated into the same layer as traces. Moving on, we're gonna talk about PCB layers. Now understand a lot of our conversation in this lecture will just be about really high level concepts. The excitement and also the danger of talking about PCBs here is that every topic quickly leads into something far more complex. So we're gonna stay as high level and abstract as we can so you can take away the most important ideas from this topic as you go and explore PCB design through KiCad. And of course, when you're making your first PCB, you're not going to have to give all these complex considerations that one might when they're making a more complex PCB for a more sophisticated system. All right, so the PCB stack up is the arrangement of those alternating copper and insulating PCB layers. So most PCBs will have multiple of the following layers. Of course, we have those copper layers, but they can be distinguished as signal or routing layers or ground and power plane layers. Then we have those insulation layers. Those might be core layers or prepreg layers. And we'll talk about each of these in greater detail. And lastly, you will usually see solder mask layers and silkscreen layers in your PCB. So let's take a look at the stack up for a, an example four layer PCB. So when I say four layer, I'm refer, the four refers to uh, four copper layers within the PCB. So any X layer PCB contains X layer of copper, contains X copper layers. So if I had a two layer PCB, that would be two copper layers. So note in the right, this diagram of the four layer PCB. Again, we have those alternating copper and insulating layers. And of course, because it's a four layer PCB, we have four copper layers. All right, so let's talk about those copper layers first. Each copper layer facilitates current flow between the components. So typically what you'll see in a four layer stack up is that the outermost copper layers at the top and the bottom will be designated as signal or routing layers. The signal or routing layers are going to be where traces and pads are etched for connecting components. Remember those traces on that first slide that you can see underneath the solder mask connecting the different pads, that'll go on the signal layer here at the top the signal layer here at the bottom. Now, typically in a four layer PCB, two innermost layers are going to serve as planes, one for ground and one for power. And remember, those ground and power planes are going to be that return path, or at least for ground, it would be a return path for common ground. Or for the power plane, it would be the starting path for the power voltage that would go into components. So why bother with the ground or power plane layer? We'll talk about this in a bit more detail when we talk about general PCB layout tips. But for now, your takeaway should be that ground and power planes are able to very effectively reduce electrical noise and improve the board's heat dissipation. 
Electrical noise is this uh, random variation in voltage and current that is experienced due to a number of factors in electrical circuits, both internal and external. This noise can pose a risk to the integrity of our signals, to the quality of the signals in our circuits. And also, they might affect components which are really sensitive to uh, variations in voltage and current that might be damaged by even small variations, especially large variations or large electrical noise. So then we have the prepreg layer. A prepreg is an insulator layer that is going to act as this sort of glue to hold the core and copper layers together. So we have in a four layer PCB two prepreg layers. And you notice how they kind of sandwich this core layer, which we're going to talk about in the morning, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Now, the trick here is while the PCB is being made, the prepreg is usually uncured. And so it contains this resin. It's been impregnated in this resin, which is going to be responsible for that sticky property. And so when we're assembling this PCB, this sticky sort of prepreg is going to help hold the different layers together, the copper layers with the, the rest of the board. And then we cure the PCB. We do so with heat and with pressure. And then when it's cured, the prepreg is going to bond all the layers together. So prepreg is made of a substrate or this insulating material. And the common types of substrates that you'll see are one, fiberglass. If you go to a PCB manufacturer, they might refer to it as FR4, or at least that's one variation of uh, this fiberglass material composite. And so it's very often used, which is why you'll see it uh, very often on manufacturing sites. And it's also cheap compared to a common alternative, which is PTFE, or you might know it as its uh, trademark name, Teflon. And PTFE has better thermal stability and electrical properties compared to FR4. But the trade-off is that it's more expensive. So let's talk about the core insulator layer. It's made of multiple prepreg layers which have been pressed together and plated with copper foil on either side and cured. So the core, unlike a prepreg, has been cured. It's no longer sticky in that sense because it, it's already been uh, pressed together between these two copper uh, layers. And so technically a core layer uh, will incorporate these two copper layers so we can treat these three layers as one, the core. And so in a four layer PCB, we only have one core and a prepreg on either side. In an eight layer PCB, and you'll have to imagine this, we would have three core layers which are sandwiched together each core layer would have uh, copper foil on either side. So that produces uh, six copper layers. And then they would be sandwiched between four prepreg layers. So those remaining two copper layers that we're looking for would be the outermost layers of that eight layer PCB. Okay, so we're getting to the end of our admittedly brief overview of PCB layers. And the last of those two layers in this stack up would be the solder mask. So the outer copper layers are covered by this thin solder mask material, which is used to protect outer traces from oxidation and prevent solder bridges between pads. If you've worked with a protoboard or a kind of perf board before, you may recall that if you had put two component leads in adjacent pads, when you soldered each of them, you might have accidentally applied just enough solder that you bridged the two pads together so that they were electrically connected. And we don't really want that, of course. So the solder mask on a PCB would help prevent that. And that's the green material that you're gonna see on the surface of the PCB. Now, sometimes it's in a different color. Another common one would be blue. Okay, that last layer of importance is going to be the silk screen. 
This is the layer where we can apply ink traces, which will often be white. And these traces are used for symbols, logos, and other sorts of component markings, which you can see here. Symbol marking for this diode, symbol marking for these capacitor components, for this component here. It's the outermost layer on either side of the board. So you can see that the ink traces, this silk screen layer, has been applied on top of the green solder mask here. And that solder mask has been applied on top of the outermost, probably the top copper layer, which is used for signal traces, which you could see. And then, of course, there are a couple more layers under this board. So that's it. Let's quickly take a look at uh, PCB fabrication. Again, from a very high level, we're just going to look at the most important aspects of the fabrication process. Okay, so the starting point would be, of course, to cut our raw materials into the boards and drill our holes. The holes that we drill will be for vias, they'll be for pads, through hole pads. And then the next step, next big step, is to uh, set all of our layers together, the core, the prepreg, and cure them. Curing is a process called lamination. And once we laminate our materials, we have this uh, PCB, which is now one solid uh, composite. You can't separate the layers anymore. And we're going to etch each copper layer to remove the excess copper, leaving only the traces. And, and keep in mind, this example is done with a two-layer PCB which is why you can only see uh, two outer copper layers, the middle layer of insulation, which would be a single core. Okay, so our next step would be then to apply the solder mask on top of our outer copper layers. Remember that traces are covered, but pads are going to be left exposed because the pads will be our connection to the component leads. We'll solder the leads to the pads. And then lastly, we will paint the silk screen onto the solder mask. Got the, this lightly colored material right here on top of the blue solder mask. Remember that the silk screen is for our logos, symbols, and component markings. And that's it for PCB fabrication. Let's talk about the PCB design process. And you will investigate this more thoroughly when you do a PCB design yourself in KiCad in our follow-up workshop. So the first step of any PCB design would be to identify the components and circuit diagrams that you would use. Usually when you design a PCB, uh, you have a project in mind. You know the components that you'll probably use. You'll know the schematics that you'll have to reference. And ideally, you've prototyped this design in some way. The next step would be schematic capture. This is where CAD software starts to come in. You're gonna use CAD, computer-aided design, to create digital schematics from the circuit diagrams which you have sourced. And these digital schematics will likely be done with a tool like uh, KiCad because it has schematic capture tools. And schematic capture as a software falls into this category of tools that you'll see called Electronic Design Automation, or EDA. This could be for schematic capture. EDA is also for simulation and tools generally in the domain of well, electronic design. That third step, after you've created your digital schematic, would be to start laying out the real PCB. And so you'll do physical component placement in your EDA tool for PCB layout, and you will route traces. Now, when you arrange the components on the PCB, you have to consider uh, the placement very carefully and consider in order of priority uh, the shape of the board, the connector locations. Let's say you have connectors for external, like an external power supply. And so you're connecting wires to the board. Obviously the connectors shouldn't be placed all willy nilly in the middle of the board. They might need to be placed on the outside, stuff like that. We have heat dissipation 
requirements. There are certain components like ICs, which under intense use generate a lot of heat. Where you place those components on the board has an impact on the proper dissipation of the heat, proper cooling of the board. If you don't have a proper resolution uh, for components that have a tendency to heat up, you may have a malfunctioning board. And then lastly, and we're going to talk about this more very soon, uh, you need to consider the locations of uh, decoupling capacitors. Again, we're going to come back to this a little bit later, and I'm going to explain what a decoupling capacitor is in greater detail. So continuing our discussion of component placement and routing, now that you have ideally arranged your components where you want them to be, you need to route the traces between the component paths. And this is where EDA comes in handy again. Uh, many tools like KiCad's routing tool will include some sort of script that can check to make sure your layout conforms to the schematic you defined and maybe the design requirements of the manufacturer to which you will send your PCB designs. That leads us to the next two steps. Uh, we have verification before you ship off your product. You, know, you want to use your design rules checking tools to make sure your components are you're properly connected, that your traces are correctly rooted, and that your manufacturer's design rules are met. Then you want to generate the manufacturing files. The EDA software that you used probably KiCad for PCB design because that's what we'll be using in open project space. That's going to create the files which you will share with the manufacturer. And these files are going to be used by machines for automated PCB fabrication. And so of course the last step after you've generated the PCB fab files would be to fabricate the PCB. You sent those files off to the manufacturer. They're going to build your PCB and then they'll send it back to you. So here's some popular PCB EDA tools. We have Altium and Autodesk Eagle. Altium is frequently used in the professional world. And on the other end of the spectrum here, you would have KiCad EDA. And the reason why we use KiCad is because it's open source and free, and it is a rather robust schematic capture and PCB design tool at that. So you've used a PCB EDA software to go and design your PCB. You've generated your manufacturing files. Now it's time to send it off to a manufacturer. Where do you go? Well, here are two common options. There's JLC PCB. They can make inexpensive two layer FR4 boards, which for hobbyists, this is, this is about all you need. And it has fast manufacturing and shipping. Now, Alternatively, you might use PCB Way. You might have more precise design requirements because your project, your PCB, is more complex. These design requirements might demand smaller traces or vias. They might demand more advanced manufacturing options. If you need this, you go to PCB Way. Now it's going to be more expensive, but if your project demands it, then it demands it. Now that we've talked about manufacturers, let's move on to our final section where we just discuss some tips for PCB layout. That first tip, and these are all going to be important, but I'm going to say this one is especially important, is to use thermal vias to cool your components. So thermal vias are going to be unconnected vias. Uh, which you will place strategically to move heat away from components through the board layers. For example, here in this diagram, we have a cross-section of a PCB and an IC, which has been seated on the top layer of the PCB. This IC generates heat, and this heat is going to be dissipated through the thermal vias across the board layers. Our next tip would be to place the board to wire connectors near the edge of the PCB. I mentioned this earlier, but I want to reiterate. If you are in a situation in which you have wires, external wires which are to connect to your PCB, you do not want to place uh, the terminals for those wires, the terminals which will be seated to the PCB, in the middle of the PCB. 
those wires are going to have to jump over components potentially. It's going to be a mess. It is much harder to connect wires there. So we strategically place our board to wire connectors along the edges of the PCB. Our next tip would be to use ground fills or planes and they will help reduce the electrical noise and improve signal integrity. And just to reiterate, electrical noise is that random variation in voltage and current, and it's going to affect your sensitive components. You also need to consider signal integrity, how well a signal maintains its original characteristics, like its strength, its shape, and its timing from sender to receiver. If you're working with an IC which generates digital signals, or really any component for that matter that sends or receives signals, digital and or analog, you want them to be reliable. You want them to be accurate to the original signal. You want high signal integrity and you want low electrical noise. Very little variation so we don't kill our sensitive components. And this is why you use ground fills or planes. They reduce the electrical noise. They improve the signal integrity. Make sure to leave spaces between your pads and traces in a way that respects the design constraints of your project. The design constraints are going to be determined in part by maybe the device packaging or the manufacturer requirements. Our next tip, and this is a bigger one, uh, would be to use decoupling capacitors on ICs. I mentioned decoupling capacitors earlier, and I promise that we return to them, and now's the time. Decoupling capacitors are capacitors whose purpose is to help reduce electrical noise and power supply signals, help reduce the variation in voltage and current output by power supply signals. It will ensure the decoupling capacitors will ensure a clean and stable power supply for the IC, which is going to prevent that unexpected behavior and malfunctions associated with components that are sensitive to voltage and current fluctuations. Where does this decoupling capacitor go? It's going to go in between the VCC and ground pins of the IC. So in this example diagram on the right, got this big IC. Let's say it's top right pin is going to be our power or VCC pin. And the bottom right pin is for ground. The top pin, uh, that VCC pin, should be connected to a decoupling capacitor, which is then connected directly to a ground plane uh, through a via. And then the ground pin, of course, should be connected to a ground plane as well. And that'll be done through a via. So we're really combining two tips here. That first tip would have been to use a ground plane. That's going to reduce electrical noise and improve signal integrity. And then to further reduce electrical noise, we are going to use a decoupling capacitor between VCC and ground. And when we do so, we want to make these traces really short and our connections as close as possible. Uh, so this decoupling capacitor should be really close to the VCC pin and the ground. And then the vias should also be very closely connected as well. So we're getting to the end here with two uh, also very important tips. One is to avoid 90 degree trace angles. So the idea here is that the corners of 90 degree angles are going to be narrower than the standard trace width. And we want traces to be consistent widths. And part of this I will explain uh, through the next tip. So instead of using 90 degree trace angles, we should strive for our 45 degree angles, our 135 degree angles instead. Stuff like this. Okay, so our last tip, an important tip, is really to carefully consider the width of your traces. Specifically, when you are using power or ground traces, you need to widen them. Widening the traces is going to reduce this resistive uh, nature to the trace. And when you re reduce this resistivity, this impedance, it's going to help reduce the heat buildup from high current. It's going to improve the power signal integrity 
And so it's going to produce a more reliable circuit overall. Now, signal traces, which are low current, so you're not, you're not as likely to have this heat buildup issue, the signal traces, which are low current, can be narrower. So again, carefully consider what a trace is going to be used for. If it's going to be used for a high current application, then the trace needs to be wider. If the trace is too narrow and you put too much current through it, the heat buildup is going to be so great that you might blow up the trace. The trace might actually catch fire. I have seen it before. So be very careful there. And as to the specifics on each of these tips, like how wide should a trace be? What value capacitor should I use for decoupling? This is really something that you are going to determine on your own for your more complex projects. Because when we cover PCB design with KiCad in our follow-up workshop, we are not going to have to worry as much about these properties because we're building a circuit which is not too sensitive to these issues. But eventually it will. And eventually you will gain an understanding, a stronger understanding of PCB design through future projects of your own, through trial and error, and through more informed decision making from further explanation of resources online. And then all of these tips, all of these concepts will not only become far more relevant, but you will know a lot more about them. This lecture is really intended to give you that exposure so you know what to look up later as you design your more complex projects, as you design your PCB projects. And that is it. Whoever you are, wherever you are, no matter what time it is, I wish you a wonderful day and stay awesome.